Our next speaker is Matt O'Mara, and Matt is going to explain his industry's vision for the future of transatlantic, transatlantic trade, and it gets into GMOs and the precautionary principles. So if you think the dairy industry is complex, wait until you hear from uh, Matt. Matt is the Director of International Affairs, Affairs for Food and Ag at the Biotechnology Industry Organization, BIO, which is the leading trade association for, um, for um, the biological foods industry. So, Matthew. Well, thank you, JB. Um, thank you for the invitation today to uh, discuss our industry's views of the TTIP. Um, I hope not to disappoint you. I, I frankly feel like uh, our industry's position is, 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 uh, is one that is pragmatic and, um, and simply focused on making sure that trade flows. Um, we're not setting course to uh, overhaul any EU legislation. Um, and so, you know, it might be somewhat uh, lacking of fireworks, as, as, as JB has suggested, that this will be a, a very con controversial, controversial area. I mean, there's no doubt that there's going to elicit um, responses on both sides of the Atlantic, but we hope that we can uh, find a uh, positive way forward. And so this, this TTIP is a tremendous opportunity for doing that. Um, just really quick on bio, uh, a little bit of background on who we are. Uh, our membership is roughly 1,100 companies. Primarily, these are uh, companies in emerging uh, stages of uh, they are growing, um, focused on research and development, uh, bringing new products to market. Uh, the overwhelming majority of these companies are the health and pharmaceutical. Uh, then there's the industrial environmental uh, group of companies, and then the companies that I work with, the food and agriculture section which covers both uh, plants and animal biotechnology. And then we work uh, globally uh, through a network uh, under CropLife International um, to uh, work with partners in, in key markets. Uh, for example, uh, Europa Bio in, in Europe is, is a key partner on this TTIP negotiation. And, uh, and we've uh, tried to, at, at, at all times, uh, present a, a unified kind of position on how to proceed on the TTIP. I'd like to set a little bit of the ag, biotech, uh, and trade context, uh, not in the depth that JB went into, of course, but uh, there's only a few people that can do that. <laughs> so, um, but generally speaking here in the U.S., uh, you know, biotech is growing. The acreage of biotech has is, 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 uh, increased dramatically since it was first commercialized in 1996. Uh, new numbers at last week I, I, out of the USDA show that uh, soy acreage for, uh, uh, is now at 93 percent, corn is at 90 percent, and cotton is at 90 percent. Um, I mean, this is testament to the fact that uh, producers of these, uh, these uh, significant crops um, really do desire uh, biotechnology and the tools that uh, biotech can provide farmers, uh, either through herbicide resistance or uh, insect resistance management. Um, and so this is a, this is a growing trend, and, and we believe the, the technology is is only going to blossom over time. The, uh, the U.S. exports roughly 40 billion worth of corn, soy, cotton. Uh, these are the primary products, not counting processed products. Um, and so, while you know biotech, well, seeds aren't really um, the focus of our, of our uh, international trade agenda. Um, what we want to make sure is that there is open market uh, or market access for uh, the users of our products. And, um, and so therefore, um, it's critical that we at work as a value chain to uh, address barriers to trade that affect biotechnology. Um, outside the US, I think the story is, is really uh, quite interesting. Um, the growth is not in the U.S. I mean, we're going to continue to grow, but the, the rapid adoption of this technology is outside the United States. Um, currently, uh, latest statistics I've seen are about 17.3 million farmers are using biotechnology uh, in some form. 90% of these farmers are resource poor. Um, so 
uh, and, and there are 28 countries uh, cultivating biotechnology currently, 20 of which are uh, developed, uh, developing countries. Um, uh, the eight others are the industri in the industrialized uh, world. Um, really what I wanted to talk about today is, is trying to think a little differently about um, you know, trade and biotech. Um, you know, this is not only a U.S. issue anymore. It's, it's no longer uh, U.S. versus Europe. I mean, frankly, it shouldn't have ever been about pitting, you know, uh, U.S. versus Europe. Um, unfortunately, that's how it played out over time. Um, but really, the driver of this technology is, are going to be the developing countries. Um, we're already starting to see that case. Um, and so we need to look at it from a different perspective. Um, the, uh, in, in 2012, 52% of uh, global crop production was outside, uh, was in developing countries. Um, some of the key issues that affect us as an industry are uh, a growing gap between approvals in the export country, the country of origin, and the country of import. Uh, this is extremely uh, complicated. It's you know, timing regulatory approvals around the world is an extremely complicated process, especially when you're you're, uh, you're bringing a new product to the market. Um, and it's critical to make sure that trade can ma be maintained because if, it's de if the technology is deployed in one exporting country, it hasn't been approved in a major importing country, you have uh, most likely uh, a situation uh, that's undesirable, which is, which is trade disruption. Um, and so our goal is to find a way to, at the extent possible, um, Kind of manage the you know manage the the global regulatory process so that it, that you know all of the, the major import markets are kind of coming to a, a decision on the technology or the the product specifically uh, all around the same time. It's critical that we try to find a way to to get these timelines to be as 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 synchronous as possible. Um, when this doesn't happen, like I said, there's trade disruption um, and. Uh, one of these, uh, one of, you know, it can result from low-level presence. Low-level low presence is, is defined by Codex as uh, the unintended presence of a, of a product uh, that's been approved in one or more exporting countries but not in the importing country. And that's a very important thing to consider because it's been approved somewhere. Uh, in many cases, it's been approved in multiple countries. It just hasn't been approved yet in the importing country. So. Industry is constantly seeking to find ways to work with uh, uh, governments, industry partners around the world to find pragmatic solutions to dealing with this uh, with this very costly issue, um, and, and attempting to uh, to smooth trade, frankly, around the world, facilitate trade. And you know, overall, what we really truly need are um, policies that are proportionate to risk and that are facilitating trade. Um, and I think this, uh, this TTIP opportunity is a perfect example of, of, you know, one that we should harness to try to establish that. Um, just a global picture of, kind of global production of, of biotechnology. As you can see, the Western Hemisphere is, is, is extremely, uh, uh, has, has adopted the technology. It's, um, they're de deploying it in Brazil, for example. Um, <coughs> You know, they're, they're, they're approving products in half the time that we're approving products here in the U.S. Uh, this is because they've made it a national priority uh, to address uh, their agricultural industry. Um, and, and so, like I said earlier, it's not just the U.S. anymore. This gap, the innovation gap, is, is really closing. Uh, you're starting to see products be developed by public institutions and commercialized, say, in Brazil, uh, that are designed you know, solely for the Brazilian market. I mean, that's an imp extremely important uh, competitive issue uh, between the U.S. and, and, and Brazil. Um, and, you know, I think the, the fact of the matter is it's, it's only going to become more of an issue. Um, so within the TTIP, uh, obviously there's going to be a great deal of attention to uh, GMOs, biotech. Um, I think it's somewhat unfortunate um, because I think the hype has kind of uh, overtaken events, um, and, I, and I think what we really need is just a rational discussion between negotiators to figure out how we move forward. Uh, there are issues that still need to be resolved. 
Uh, the WTO case, for example, remains un unsettled. Uh, that was taken in, uh, I think the, the, the decision in WTO was in 2007. But having said that, I don't think we're anticipating, you know, complete, uh, you know, nirvana as a result of the TTIP. I mean, I think we're, we'll, we need to be realistic here and, and, and find uh, and, and realize that, uh, that we want to set the framework within TTIP and we want to continue to work as partners going forward and resolving issues as they, uh, as they occur. Um, TTIP, uh, you know, industry views TTIP as that, that opportunity. It's, it's, it's the time to forge a new relationship. Um, you know, biotech is now, but what's it going to be in 20 years? You know, we need a trading relationship that is able to um, f be, be flexible and accommodate um, technology. We need technology. There is, we're not, uh, there's no more land. You know, we can't produce more land. We can't produce, you know, more water. We need to use existing resources in a much more efficient way. We need all forms of agriculture to do that. It's just, it's not just biotechnology. We need technology from tractors at John Deere or, or, or uh, what have you. I mean, it's, 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 agriculture and technology is synonymous at this point, and we need to embrace that. Um, so, I, so I, I'd, Getting to the kind of the point of our position, um, it's really focusing on predictability, increasing predictability, facilitating trade, and working within the existing laws and regulations. Uh, to be clear, we're not seeking to change any of the EU's approach to cultivation, uh, and to be clear, we're not we're not seeking to change uh, their approach to labeling. It's it's that's not our desire with this trade agreement. We want to find ways to facilitate trade. Um, Specifically, the bio position is uh, to enforce the existing uh, legislative timelines uh, for approvals, you know, remove the politics from the decision-making process. And what we find is, a, you know, a great deal of the delays that we see in uh, the approval process come after the European Food Safety Authority has, has, has issued a positive opinion. And we want to find a way to, uh, to enable, you know, decisions to go forward um, once that, you know, EFSA review is, has taken place. Um, currently, I think the, uh, the, the numbers in the pipeline are there's 74 or so applications awaiting approval in, in the EU. Um, 50 or so of them uh, are still within the EFSA process, but 22 of them have been approved, uh, have not, have been, you know, there's been an, a positive opinion issued for these products. And, uh, but they've sat, through the, you know, in the decision-making process for as, as long as three and a half years. And so that's really what we're talking about, getting rid of that, uh, that, that situation, eliminating that situation. We think one way to kind of address it in a practical sense is, is looking at how we, we stacked products or combined event products regulated. A lot of the backlog in Europe is frankly due to the, the, the approach that they've taken on stacked products where they look at every possible combination of a stacked event. Um, we think there's a much more scientific way of going about that, and, um, and, and we would encourage that discussion to happen so that we can kind of remove some of the backlog that we believe is, is, is taking up a lot of the resources. Um, there's a, there's, this is very technical, but there's the technical solution, which in Europe for, for, uh, for feed imports, um, this has to do with, uh, it's, it kind of, it scratches at the surface of the LLP, the low level presence. Um, but currently, uh, there is a technical solution which essentially redefines zero, recognizing the zero is not possible, um, that there can be a very low uh, level of uh, presence of an unapproved product, uh, so long as it, I believe the criteria, so long as it is already in the EFSA process. Um, but we would like to see that expanded to food and seed, uh, because those are both extremely important. Uh, we believe that currently in, in a, in a feed-only context, it's, it's not, uh, workable, um, and then really address um, LLP in a much more meaningful way. Um, the way I approach this is, let's find a way to let's find a mechanism within this agreement to not stop trade, particularly if the product has been approved in several exporting countries and also received a positive opinion from the European Food Safety Authority. You know that's the 
you know, every, every country, every member of the WTO has a right to do a scientific review, a right to do a, uh, a take a decision on approving a product. Um, we believe, however, they have to do that within a timely manner. I mean, that's what the, the SPS agreement says. It should, there should be no undue delay. And I would say that the definition of undue delay is after scientific, your own scientific authority has, has uh, issued a positive opinion to then not have a decision. So I think, we, again, we just need to focus on that area of how to you know, smooth that situation. Um, and then above everything else, uh, we need an improved dialogue. We need increased count accountability. I don't think it's uh, for any sector, it's ideal to go off and to dispute settlement anytime there's an issue. Um, we need, I think, a very, uh, very thoughtful approach in all of our trade agreements to increasing the accountability of, of, of uh, the trade ministers, the agriculture ministers, um, the technical groups that are working. Um, no doubt, very hard, but I think there needs to be uh, you know, an annual stock taking uh, where the trade ministers and the ag ministers you know, are expecting um, uh, you know, a report out from the technical level and, you know, forces a discussion. It's on the books. We don't have to request the, the meeting. And, um, and I think that that would be important for us as we, as, as, you know, these two economies go forward in this, in this TTIP to kind of, kind of reset the rules, reset the, the, um, the approach to how we're going to manage disputes. Um, so why is it important, why do we believe it's important to address biotech within the TTIP? I mean, the fir first and foremost, if it's not the U.S., it's going to be another country. I mean, Brazil is, like I said, moving forward, Ar Argentina, Canada, India, China. I mean, these countries are moving forward with the technology, um, and so we think it's only practical to address biotech in, within the context of this agreement. And then the demand for imported grain and oilseed will continue to grow. And farmers will adopt the technology, whether it's biotech or another, another technology down the road. And so we have to find a way. Um, and we, I think it's undesirable, but I think the fact of the matter is that countries with regulatory regimes that you know, either don't follow international standards or aren't you know, consistent with international standards or those that can't be predictably in, implemented over time, they're at the mo greatest risk for trade disruption. And they're at the greatest risk, therefore, uh, for you know shocks in prices, uh, and and I think we should, as we move forward, especially when we're talking about global food security, try to remove, uh, to the extent possible, all those unnecessary shocks to uh, price uh, and markets. So uh, that's that's my uh, that's my two cents. Thank you very much.